Good afternoon, sir. Tell us who you are. My name is Klaus Stoner. I'm from Vienna and uh, I research unexplainable artifacts since 1997. And what brings you to megalithomania this year particularly? What, what news do you have to share with us? Uh, there are some news uh, about uh, giants and uh, also megalithic uh, monuments and uh, stone uh, structures and also some uh, very interesting artifacts. Do you think the sites globally, the ancient megalithic sites from South America to Egypt to, to Britain, um, do you think there's a unifying component? Are we looking at the remnants of an ancient parent culture? I think uh, there is a connection between all those stone buildings because we also found uh, stones in many countries with the same unknown writings like uh, Ecuador, Colombia, United States, France, Italy, Malta, even in Australia. So that for me it would uh, be uh, the, the, the confirmation that once in the past there existed a global civilization or at least a global communication. And for you personally, um, in your um, research, um, what's the most exciting discovery for you in recent times? Uh, the last most exciting discovery was together with Michael Tellinger in uh, South Africa, the hundred thousands of very big stone circles which are producing sound and energy. Interesting. And, and have you been able to measure this? Uh, Michael did a lot of uh, research on the spot and uh, we visited uh, some of those circles and he explained me all the results on the spot. Very interesting. Now a lot of your research is um, anomalous art archaeological artifacts but also um, into giants. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, in the year 2003, I got an invitation uh, for a meeting with 15 elders of the big tribes in the United States through Wine Deloria. And uh, the story of the three days meeting was giants and little people. Until, until this time, I didn't have really uh, information about giants and little people. And uh, from that day on, uh, more and more information came up and uh, in the last years I could uh, collect many informations and even artifacts which definitely prove that uh, giants and little people existed in the past. And when um, I think there's a degree of uh, um, misunderstanding about what we mean when we say giant or perhaps what, what you mean when you say giant. For some people, anybody who's slightly larger than the average is a giant, but you're talking about significantly large beings, no? Yes, for example, the biggest one until now, I got some uh, bones from Ecuador from a 7.6 meter human giant skeleton. 7.6 meters? Yes, and I got information from the Russian eye doctor and researcher Professor Muldashev that he could see even uh, the, the uh, bodies of 10 meter uh, giants in the so-called Samadhi tunnel in Tibet where there are people from normal size up to 10 meters in the lotus seat and the body has no function but as the monks explained him they are connected through the silver string with the universe and they could come to life again whenever they would decide. Wow. And uh, I remember speaking with Brian, uh, Brian Forrester. Uh, there seems to be a thread running through with red-haired people, the red-headed people, the tribes in Africa, the red-headed in South America, that seem to be connected, some with the elongated skulls, some with certainly very ancient tribes. Do you find that there's a red-head component with some of these giants? Uh, that's what I cannot uh, confirm because until now we, we don't have any uh, real fact on this. Okay, interesting. So um, just to move into, into the megaliths and monoliths um, a little more, um, do you believe that the builders of places like uh, Machu Picchu, like the Giza uh, necropolis, like uh, Stonehenge perhaps even, do you think that they had a greater technology than we do today? That's what I think because uh, many of the transportations of that uh, very big stones 
until today it would be quite impossible, especially if you have to pass over some mountains, over some valleys, some rivers. There's not really an explanation how did they do it and they must have, have had a knowledge which we do not have until our days. And, and one of the other common factors that seems to come up more and more as people research this are the astronomical alignments. It seems that these ancient peoples um, who built these sites had more than a rudimentary understanding of, of the stars, of astronomy, and indeed of how to align. What, what do you make of that? I, got, uh, I had a very, very wonderful experience in Ecuador because in the 18th century, a French uh, delegation went to Ecuador near Quito and they were researching for the equinoxial zero point on the equator and they found the place and in, in our days there is now a very big monument exactly at that place and when I visited this place with uh, Luis Viracocha, he is the chief of the indigenous around Quito uh, he brought us to this place and then he asked me, would you like to see the real zero point uh, on the equator? And I said, yes, it's here. He said, no. And we drove up with a four-wheel drive on a mountain close to Quito. And the last 500 meters we had to walk up. And on the top of this mountain there was a huge stone circle and we had two GPS uh, with us and we made the measurement and the zero point, exactly, the equinoxial zero point on the equator is up on that mountain, just inside that stone circle. That means that those people, thousands of years ago, they knew exactly where the real equinoxial zero point on the equator is. And there is a young uh, archaeologist who is doing the research there, and he found out that exactly all the, the important uh, places in South America are exactly on these equinoxial lines going out from this uh, zero point. So that means uh, how could they have known that? It's, it's a big question. It's startling and, and not least of course because due to um, the actual tilt of the earth and the change over time and of course the precession of the equinoxes that point is going to change over millennia so if it's aligned again now, presumably it means it's, it was originally aligned a very long time ago. That could be. I mean, there is no other explanation. So how can we be sure what the ancients were doing when there are no records, or very few records that survive from that date? The only uh, things we, I think, uh, exists are stone and carvings in stone. And I think if they, if they had such a big knowledge, they also might have known that the only material which does not change the surface, even after thousands of years, is stone. So the most uh, unexplainable artifacts I found are made out of stone. And the problem, of course, is that you cannot uh, age dating the stones. That's the biggest problem. And. Why do you suppose that today we're finding that so many people are drawn to these ancient sites? What, what's the, what is the effect that they are having on us? I think uh, we could learn a lot from the past if we would study more and more the ancient history and uh, the ancient civilizations. Mm. I mean, I, I, from a personal perspective, I've been going to sites like Avery and Stonehenge for, for some years and in the very short space of time over the last 10 years or so I've seen a, a rise, a, a significant rise in the number of people that go to the equinoxes and the solstices. What, what do you think it is about it that seems to be drawing people more? I think uh, of course also the information in our days is much bigger than it was uh, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, internet helps, of course, also a lot in researches uh, because it's more easy to exchange information with, worldwide with any country. And that, of course, helps also to raise the interest of the people. And we find ourselves uh, inexorably and inevitably uh, finally in the, uh, in the year 2012. Um, assuming that we're all still here after the winter solstice, December 21st, what 
do you see in 2013 and beyond in your research, but for, for wider humanity? I have a lot of plans for the future, so I am already planning 2013, 14, 15, 15. I'm not afraid uh, that the world will be destroyed, but I think there is a kind of uh, raising consciousness uh, of human going on. Whatever that, uh, the, uh, where it comes from, I don't know, but uh, there is some movement going on. And where are you going to be drawn to next? I know you've been working a lot in Ecuador and also with, with Mike Tellinger in, uh, in South Africa. Where, where have you got your sights on? Where do you passionately want to be next? I should go to Bolivia, but also again to South Africa, then to Mexico. Then there are some places in Bolivia, uh, in uh, Colombia, also in uh, Ecuador. I mean, there are so many places I should go and I would like to go. So 2012 for me is definitely not the ending. Klaus Turner, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we come.